So how does the small bowel work? How do we digest and absorb all of these nutrients? Carbohydrates, proteins, fats, water, electrolytes, vitamins and minerals. It's crazy. Well, today we're going to crush all of it and you're going to understand how the small intestine works. Let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon and I'm pumped that you're here today. We're going to be talking about small intestinal physiology. It's a big topic. So this video is complementary to the small bowel anatomy, embryology, and histology video. So if you haven't checked that out, definitely watch that after this video. So after these two videos, the anatomy one and this physiology or how does it work video, we're gonna get right into the different pathologies that a surgeon encounters in the small intestine. That could be things like obstruction, malrotation volvulus, internal hernias, medical diverticulum, inflammatory bowel disease, intestinal atresia. There's a ton of things we're gonna cover. We're gonna knock them out one by one, and then we're gonna to go to the next region of the body. So hold on to your seats. Let's get into small intestinal physiology. So how does the gut work, and why do we need to know it? Well, it's important to know why the gut works or how the gut works so that you know the consequences of taking parts of the gut out. So what are the consequences of taking out the terminal ileum or doing an ileocecectomy? There may be some consequences with respect to enterohepatic circulation or the absorption of intrinsic factor with vitamin B12 or cobalamin. It's also important to understand if we're gonna have a complete understanding of nutrition, how do carbohydrates get absorbed in the small intestine and where do they get absorbed? How does water get absorbed and where does it get absorbed? Does it all get absorbed in the small bowel or does it all get absorbed in the colon? You're gonna find out today. And we wanna get into this question of how does it work? We gotta look at two things and they're totally separate. Now, number one is digestion and number two is absorption. Now, what is digestion? So digestion is the mechanical or chemical breakdown of food fragments into small particles. So the mouth and the stomach are the big churners. They're gonna start that digestive process. The stomach is gonna turn food into chyme or particles less than one millimeter, and that's gonna be with the help of different hormones, enzymes, as well as the acid in the stomach and how the stomach churns. The small bowel is gonna to continue to digest with things like the segmental contractions, which are contractions of the circular muscle, which are responsible for some small bowel motility. And we're gonna get into that. So digestion is the first part to understand. If you haven't had a chance to go to the nutrition lectures, I have three really good lectures on nutrition. One is the nutritional assessment, and then it gets into how to think about design TPN. Also, a couple of the first videos that I did, that metabolic response to injury, and then what is the fuel of repair, the fuel of injury. Those are two videos that I would definitely go back to. So if you've watched the videos, you got the knowledge and you're ready to jump in, or you just want to jump in, let's do it. So first, carbohydrates. So we take about 300 to 350 grams per day of carbohydrates. Now, how many calories is that? Remember, about four kilocalories per gram of carbohydrates. So that's between 12 and 1400 kilocalories of carbohydrates a day. So based on a 2000 calorie diet, that's a significant amount of energy that's derived from carbohydrates. Beginning of digestion and absorption of carbohydrates begins where? It begins in the mouth. Now, not only to chew things up, but we have salivary amylase, and that's gonna help break down starch. So let's get into that. Now, dietary starch is about 50% of the amount of carbohydrate that we take in every day. And if we break down starch, we say, well, what is starch? Starch is either amylopectin, or that's 80%, and amylose is the other 20%. Now, we can't absorb amylose or amylopectin, so we gotta break it down. So amylase helps break down amylopectin at the alpha-1,4 bond to create maltose and maltotriose. Amylose, or the other 20% of starch, is broken down at the alpha-1,6 bond by amylase to create maltose, maltotriose, and dextrins. And we're gonna get into how these are absorbed down in the small intestine here in a minute. What other than starch for carbohydrates? Well, we take in a lot of sugar. So we take in sucrose, 
we take in lactose. And then we take in others like maltose, glucose, fructose, sorbitol, even cellulose, which we can't digest and absorb. So these carbohydrates, all of the starches and sugars, are gonna begin digestion in the mouth, both by chewing it up and then with the amylase that start to break down these starches. They're gonna go down in the stomach and then the stomach is gonna break them, like I said, in these particle sizes that are less than one millimeter. They're gonna exit the stomach through the pylorus and begin to enter the duodenum. Now in the duodenum, that's where a bunch of the magic happens. So we have several organs that are now involved in carbohydrate digestion and absorption. So what are these organs? Well, number one is the liver. Number two is the biliary system. And number three is the pancreas. So how are each of these involved? Now the pancreas is gonna give us a ton of different enzymes that are gonna help with carbohydrate digestion so that we can have absorption, all right? You're also gonna have a number of enzymes that are present at the brush border. We call these brush border enzymes. And they're gonna break down the larger sugars into smaller sugars that can be absorbed. So let's get into a few of these enzymes because these are kind of those nitty gritty things that can come up on tests. So first we have lactose. Now that's gonna be broken down by lactase into glucose and galactose. We have maltose. Maltose is gonna be broken down by maltase into glucose. We have sucrose, which is gonna be broken down by sucrase isomaltase, and that's gonna be broken down into glucose and fructose. And then we have the dextrins, and dextrins are gonna be broken down by isomaltase into glucose. So these are some of those things that you just need to memorize, but it does help to understand how we start with large molecules like starches and sugars, and they're all broken down into very small, simple sugars that can then be absorbed. So let's get into that. So when we take a broad view of the small bowel, we can start by taking a look at this piece of intestine, okay? Now when we look at that intestine, we can kind of zoom in and get a little deeper to see how these nutrients are absorbed. So let's check out this diagram. So as we begin to zoom in, we see that in the small intestine, we now have these folds. Then within each of these folds, we then have these larger villi. And then within each of these villi, we have microvilli. And then within each of these microvilli, we then have the enterocyte. And the enterocytes is where all of the absorption happens. And so those enterocytes line these microvilli, and you can see that in this histological slide here. Now we introduced that in the last video on small bowel anatomy when we talked about the different cell types that are on a microvillus, whether that's a enterocyte, whether that's a goblet cell or a panna cell or an enteroendocrine cell, or even a stem cell. So if you uh, don't know about those, go back, watch that video, or have a read in the chapter. So it's important to understand that histological anatomy so we know where things are being absorbed. In the enterocyte, that's where it's happening. So I introduced you to those brush border enzymes like lactase or isomaltase, and those break down the larger sugars into monosaccharides. And here I'm gonna show you how those monosaccharides go from the intestinal lumen through the enterocyte and into the blood. So we can see in this diagram that we have the intestinal lumen and that's on the far right. And then we have the enterocyte and then we have the blood. So let's look at each of these monosaccharides, for example, glucose. So these monosaccharides enter the enterocyte and exit the enterocyte into the blood through specific transporters. So in the enterocyte, Glucose is brought into the cell with SGLT1, and it's brought in by facilitated diffusion. Remember, facilitated diffusion is using an ion that's going along its gradient to bring another molecule in. So for example, sodium, it wants to get into the cell because that sodium potassium pump, which you can see on the basolateral membrane, is actively using ATP and pushing sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. So facilitated diffusion with glucose brings that molecule of glucose into the enterocyte with sodium, and that's using the SGLT1 transporter. Fructose, on the other hand, comes through on the GLUT5 transporter through that membrane 
with between the enterocyte and the intestinal lumen. I also want to mention here that galactose also uses that SGLT1 transporter and you can exchange kind of glucose and galactose as the same thing when it comes to the intestinal enterocyte. All right, well, what happens on the basal lateral membrane? Well, we have a different transporter here. So on the basal lateral membrane, whether it's fructose, glucose, galactose, that's gonna be the GLUT2 transporter. And that's gonna be how glucose leaves the enterocyte and gets into the blood. So that's how carbohydrates are digested and absorbed. So really quick, we begin in the mouth, we churn it up in the stomach, we have salivary amylase, that's gonna start breaking down that starch, the amylopectin and the amylose. Then once we get into the small bowel from the duodenum, we start to mix in with bile, pancreatic juices, and that's gonna start breaking down those starches. The brush border enzymes are gonna break those larger sugar molecules into manosaccharides, and they're gonna be absorbed from the intestinal lumen to the enterocyte by facilitated diffusion and then into the blood. We got those different transporters, whether it's SGLT1 for glucose and galactose, or GLUT5 for fructose, and then on the basal lateral side, we got GLUT2 that's gonna get it from the enterocyte to the blood. Pretty straightforward. If you need to look at it again, just hit the back key, and now let's get into protein. So protein, as I talked about in that nutrition video, we consume about one to one and a half grams per kilo per day. Well, there are four kilocals per gram of protein, so how much is that? For a 70 kilo person, that's gonna be about 280 to 420 kilocals from protein a day. Now, protein digestion begins in the stomach because gastric acid begins to denature proteins or sort of unravel them. So once the proteins get in the duodenum, we're gonna have increase in enterokinase from cells in the duodenum, and this is gonna activate trypsinogen to form trypsin. Now, trypsin is like that top of the food chain enzyme that is gonna activate a cascade of other enzymes, specifically endopeptidases. Now, what's an endopeptidase? Now, it's a long word, but basically, just think about it. You have endo and you have exo. Endopeptidases are gonna break down proteins in the middle of the protein. Exopeptidases, which we're gonna talk about, take amino acids off the end of a protein. And so these endopeptidases produce polypeptide fragments. So what are some common or popular endopeptidases? So first, how about trypsin? So trypsin attacks peptide bonds of basic amino acids. Chymotrypsin is a different endopeptidase that hydrolyzes or attacks peptide bonds of aromatic amino acids. So think about, well, what are the aromatic amino acids? And then elastase, hydrolyzes or attacks peptide bonds of neutral amino acids. And so once we have these polypeptide fragments, then the exopeptidases can start breaking down or digesting these proteins from the ends. And so exopeptidases produce amino acids or single amino acids, as well as di and tripeptides. Now, how do we get from the lumen? We have all these di and tripeptides, these single amino acids. How do we get into the enterocyte? Again, through facilitated diffusion with sodium. So sodium's gonna pass down its osmotic gradient and bring with it single amino acids, maybe a dipeptide or a tripeptide. Then within the cell, those di and tripeptides will be further broken down and some of these will go into secreted proteins for the cell or structural proteins for the cell. And then a portion of these will diffuse or be transported out of the enterocyte and into the blood. And so now we've taken carbohydrates and proteins, digested and absorbed them. Let's get to fat. So how many grams of fat do we take in a day? Obviously, some people are taking in more than others, but in general, we can think about it as 60 to 100 grams of fat per day. Now, how many kilocals is that? So nine kilocals per gram of fat, and that brings the kilocalorie count from 540, if there are 60 grams of fat, up to 900 kilocalories per day. Now triglycerides are the most abundant fat that we consume. And this is three fatty acids on a glycerol molecule. You can see that here. Hopefully no nightmares from biochemistry. Gonna keep it real simple, all right? So we have this triglyceride and it's important to know that most fat digestion 
happens in the small intestine. Now, fat digestion and absorption can be a little complicated, so I'm gonna to try to make it really simple. The first thing to understand is, just like when you put oil on water, fat molecules are hydrophobic, and so they don't wanna go into the cell. We gotta do something to them first, and we can't just break them down because they're kind of bouncing off and trying to stay away from us. So how do we do that? Well, in our body, we have soap. We have detergent of sorts. And that detergent is in bile, with bile salts and lecithin. Now, after we have a fatty meal, and our pancreas secretes a gastrointestinal hormone, so cholecystokinin, that's gonna cause that gallbladder to squeeze and get a nice load of bile that's gonna go in to the duodenum and small intestine. Now, what's that bile gonna do? Well, the intestine is gonna start to agitate that fat droplet through segmental contractions, which are from the circular muscle, we're gonna talk about that, and peristalsis, or the longitudinal contractions, that's gonna agitate the fat and form these mixed micelles. Now, these mixed micelles have this hydrophilic outer core with the hydrophobic inner core. And so now we can start to interact with these intestinal enterocytes because the outer surface is now hydrophilic. When we've agitated these larger fat droplets and made these smaller mixed micelles or combinations of fat with bile salts and lecithin, we can now start to digest or break down that fat droplet or mixed micelle. And we do that with pancreatic lipase and colipase. So pancreatic lipase has to actually bind with colipase to be activated, and that's gonna start to break down these triglycerides. But of the small bowel, pancreatic lipase and colipase are gonna break down these triglycerides into monoglycerides, diglycerides, and free fatty acids. Those are going to diffuse into the intestinal enterocyte, where they're going to actually be reincorporated back into triglycerides. Now that's a component of fatty acid metabolism, and I would definitely look up, there's some great Wikipedia articles on that, I'll put them in the description below so you can get an understanding of how these triglycerides are rebuilt. Within the enterocyte, so once the triglycerides are reformed, they're gonna combine with cholesterol, phospholipids, and apoproteins. These are gonna form those chylomicrons, and chylomicrons are now going to leave the enterocyte through lacteals. Lacteals are the small vessels in the lymphatics, or the small lymphatic vessels. And they're gonna travel through the lymphatic vessels, eventually reaching the cisterna chyli, or the collection of an intestinal lymph ducts. And from there, travel up the thoracic duct on the left side to the junction of the internal jugular vein with this left subclavian vein, and that's where they'll re-enter the venous circulation. So that's how fats, proteins, and carbohydrates are both digested and absorbed. So now there's a few things that we need to talk about. Now the first, and this gets back to knowing your anatomy, and that's enterohepatic circulation. So what is enterohepatic circulation, and what is the major component of this? So enterohepatic circulation is how we preserve our bile. So the vast majority of bile is reabsorbed. We only lose about a half a gram of bile acids a day in our stool. The rest is absorbed in the terminal ileum through enterohepatic recirculation. So what is that? So bile is made of both conjugated and unconjugated bile acids. They're gonna enter the small intestine and help with lipid digestion and absorption. Remember, to form those smaller mixed micelles so that pancreatic lipase and colipase can begin to digest those triglycerides. All right, so when the unconjugated and conjugated bile acids are within the lumen, the unconjugated bile acids can be directly reabsorbed in the jejunum and go back to the portal circulation. The conjugated bile acids are reabsorbed in the terminal ileum to reach the portal circulation. So if you do a distal ileal resection, you can get rid of that terminal ileum, and then you can lose a good portion of your enterohepatic circulation. So it's definitely something to think about 
when you're sacrificing that distal small bowel. So now we got to get into just a couple of other things. And let's get into water absorption, electrolytes, and vitamins. So it's a little crazy to think about, but about eight to 10 liters of water hits the small intestine every day. And the majority of that water is reabsorbed in the small intestine with about 500 milliliters reaching the colon to undergo further reabsorption. With respect to the electrolytes, we're gonna take each of these. So sodium and calcium are reabsorbed by active mechanisms in the intestine. Chloride is absorbed in the upper small bowel by passive diffusion. Bicarbonate is a little interesting because bicarbonate combines with hydrogen to form carbonic acid, so that's H2CO3. In H2CO3, if you look at it, you can see that it dissociates into water and CO2. Now the water stays as a part of chyme in the small bowel, but the CO2 is reabsorbed. With iron, iron is absorbed both as heme and non-heme components in the duodenum. And with respect to other electrolytes like potassium, magnesium, phosphate, and others, those are absorbed throughout the mucosa of the small intestine. Now how about vitamins? So vitamins gets a little complicated only because we split vitamins into two groups. So what are those two groups? So you got fat soluble vitamins. So that's vitamins A, vitamins D, vitamins E, and vitamin K, so ADEC. Now fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, are carried in those mixed micelles and absorbed in the intestinal enterocytes where they're combined into chylomicrons and then transported to the venous system as we talked about earlier. When it comes to water-soluble vitamins, things get a little more complicated. Some of the water-soluble vitamins are, for example, biotin, vitamin C, nicotinic acid, folic acid, riboflavin or vitamin B2, thiamine, vitamin B1, pyridoxine, vitamin B6, and cobalamin or vitamin B12. Now vitamin C, that is absorbed by sodium-coupled active transport in the small bowel. Pyridoxin or vitamin B6, that's with simple diffusion in the proximal small bowel. Thiamine or vitamin B1, remember that's important with wet beriberi or sometimes in chronic alcoholics can have thiamine deficiency. Well, that's absorbed by active transport in the jejunum. Riboflavin or vitamin B2 is facilitated transport in the proximal intestine. And then cobalamin, and that's an important one. This one really does come up on test because it is a little different. And this is absorbed with intrinsic factor in the terminal ileum. So that one is a little bit different. Remember, vitamin B12 combines with intrinsic factor in the stomach to go to the terminal ileum where then it's reabsorbed. Now another component of small bowel digestion absorption, small bowel physiology, is motility. So how does one piece of food or one piece of nutrition or nutrient component get from one end to the other? Well, it gets from that one end to the other by a combination of peristalsis and segmental contractions. So peristalsis is that wave, that wave that goes from proximal to distal or ab orally at one to two centimeters per second. Now these waves are usually stimulated by these MMCs or migrating motor complexes that begin in the stomach. Remember those migrating motor complexes, they happen during fasting and they're interrupted during meals, okay? And they initiate peristalsis and peristalsis is usually from the longitudinal muscle fibers in the small intestine. Remember, we talked about in the anatomy video, these layers of the small intestine from the serosa through the muscular layers, both longitudinal and then circular, down to the submucosa and the mucosa. So what is a segmental contraction? So segmental contractions are a little bit different. And these are from the circular muscle fibers in the small intestine. And in segmental contractions, you can get movement of food both orally and aborally, or forward and backward. And so what's the reason to do this? Well, the reason to do this is to agitate and to continue to break up that chyme into those smaller molecules that can then be absorbed. So like we talked about 
migrating mortar complexes start these peristaltic waves. About 75% of these begin in the stomach, but you can also have these generated in the duodenum or the proximal jejunum. That's about 25% of the time. Okay, that was small bowel physiology. Combine this with that master class on small bowel anatomy, embryology, and histology, and you have a fantastic foundation to start to understand surgical problems in the small intestine or of the small intestine. And that's what we're gonna get into next. If you like these videos, definitely share them with your friends. If you have comments, if you have questions, definitely leave them in the comment section of the video. I try to get back to all of you when you have a question and I love engaging with you guys. If you haven't checked out citizensurgeon.com, do that. Go ahead, subscribe, share this with your friends. I hope you guys are continuing to crush it. So as always, work hard, be healthy, be safe. I'll see you next time.